Here we are at Heavenly Hawaiian 100% Kona Coffee. And let me tell you something, what we learned today, we will post on here and we're gonna take the tour and see what this coffee is all about. So we will start here very shortly. Thank you. Follow this direction and then we get coffee up behind us up to 1800 feet. So we're at this nice little sweet spot on what's called Mauna Kualalai. So there's a lot of history to this area. About a thousand years ago, there was lava right down to the ocean. Now this lava hasn't eroded very much in the rain yet. So therefore, when it rains here, the rain just takes any soil with it right down to the ocean. So of course, we can lose our soil. So the history begins by some Japanese who were as part of the sugar migration. And this particular set said, screw that, I don't want to work with sugar. And they ran again. And they ran away from South Point to up here. Now the Hawaiians were not using dirt or farming back then. The Hawaiians used it to slide on mud. That's right, they had wooden things almost like a loo. The town down here called Honu Aloha, small tiny town you might drive through, translates to long sled run. It's just the way it was. There was no farming up here back then. But then the Japanese knew what to do. This was similar to their volcano in Japan. So they built terraces. And this would catch the soil as it slid down the mountain. Now, these soil beds, these terraces, grew coffee trees because that's what they knew would break up the rock. Coffee was not planted for it to be the coffee itself. Coffee was planted for, to, because of the roots. The roots can break right through solid lava rock. Very important. And then later, somebody tasted it and went, wait a minute, mm, this is tasty coffee. And of course, now we have our Kona coffee industry today. Some of these trees have a lot of history to them as well. Now what you're seeing is a bulldozed area. So this area made flatter in the mid 1990s, a little bit flatter anyway. And of course the trees are in beautifully planted rows that makes them very easy to farm by modern standards. Some history though is still with these old Japanese terraces. I mentioned I'm from here. My father's farm is just half a mile up this road. We have eight acres. Our eight acres was never bulldozed. We still have those original Japanese built terraces with the trees planted by them. My father's trees date to 1910, so 110 years old. Oldest trees in the area, 125 years old. They're still cranking out good quality coffee. <laughs> so you take good care of these trees, they're gonna last a long time, much like grapevines. Same kind of thing, a lot of history comes with it. And then you take care of them, they're gonna last for a long time. The origin sources, Guatemalan Tipica is the first one that ever came to Hawaii. And we have that here too. Most of the trees, in fact, everything you're gonna see today is a Guatemalan Tipica tree. Up on our tasting bar, that's labeled as silk. Then on our lower property, we have Costa Rica's progeny, a hybrid tree, grafted tree, that ends up as what we call bold. So that's another sample for tasting bold coffee. Now these two types, one top on his left here is a coffee content, top five. And you'll see them with different colored labels. So a quick side note that any of the tasting labels match the bags in the store. So if you like a red label, red bag, get that bar, it makes it pretty easy. Because I'm gonna give you some good information today. So. Now, these two tree types, as well as one that we don't have tasting today called a Brazilian Mocha Hebre, these three origin sources come from different parts of the world. But other farmers have other types too. It does not matter what type of tree you have, any tree growing here in Kona picked up two attributes that it's famous for. Number one, less caffeine. Our trees don't stress out as much in the growing process, therefore they just don't produce as much caffeine. Our coffee is smoother for that reason, it's smoother on the brain is what I'm talking about, right? Okay? So it's a comfortable coffee bar. But number one is this low acidity. Volcanic soils are famous for low acidity coffees. Kona's just has that right balance and therefore makes it smooth down on the tongue, doesn't kill our stomach and that kind of thing. So those two attributes, any type of coffee tree, go to other farms, you'll find they're, they're the same in that way. Now these origin sources, trees, and also the land yeah. are actually not the important part. Our climate, the stuff above us, is number one on why this area grows coffee so well. Most places you have to be high up in the mountains. But here, high up in the mountains means different things. For example, Mauna Kea gets so tall and so powerfully wintry sometimes that it can hit negative 51 Celsius. That's also negative 46 in, in uh, excuse me, negative 51 in Fahrenheit, negative 46 in Celsius. So that's pretty cold. Hilo, America's wettest city, has oh, way too much rain. Uh, I, you may have heard me mention rain for 32 days straight there, so way too much rain there. Our climate in Kona just happens to be matched to coffee because we get morning sunshine. Almost every single day of the year, the sun is out in the morning, blue sky. And then in the afternoon, this happens. This is because the clouds come from Hilo side, but they dump their rain there. 
So they kind of creep around this mountain, and then they hit the hot air temperatures out in the Pacific here in the daytime, and therefore the clouds hug the mountain top. And that effect is why the mountain is named Mount Nahua Lai, means mountain in the clouds. So this effect is so regular that the trees experience morning sunshine and afternoon shade. And of course, clouds bring rain. You get about 80 inches of rain up here compared to about 20 or so in town. But the shade is number one. Coffee does not like hot sun. So it gets morning sun where it's gentle and then shade by nature to cover up the trees. And that process being so regular is why cold coffee is famous. But we only produce 0.5 of the world's coffee. There's only 6,000 acres here, guys. That's it. And so we're going to learn about why it's such a high quality thing. At the end of the tour, we'll see the trees where the ripe uh, beans are to see where we start the process. We end up in processing where we'll show you all of our steps involved to get to the cup of coffee you're drinking. Quality is really important after the tour. We're hoping you might like to purchase some in our store. Please keep in mind, prices are expensive here. But also keep in mind, this is the only coffee picked and grown in the United States. Everything done here is done by American labor rates that they pay in Panama 30 cents an hour to do. We pay $30 an hour to do. So for example, it's gonna be expensive coffee no matter what we do. Therefore, it's our job to make sure that's some of the best coffee you ever had. Then it makes it worth your money today. And I also need to teach you about what this 100% Kona coffee is all about, the state law protecting you guys from buying bad quality coffee. And there's ways to get around the law, so watch out for some in town. I'm gonna to show you how they use trick words to give you low quality coffee for a high price tag. Let me tell you what, if you're gonna spend good money on coffee, at least make sure it's good coffee. That's mm -hmm. number one, right? So let's start off, let's head out to the parking lot, let's go see the trees themselves, okay? Come on down, you can leave cups up if you're done. We have some fresh fruit here picked by the people that work here. Um, we only sell coffee, so this is donation only. We'll pay for their meals and stuff, but grab whatever fruit you like. Those apple bananas are amazing. And if you like that one extra coffee, Konale, this is our Konalani coffee store. Brewmaster Lauren in here will make you some coffee drinks after the tour, teas, Italian sodas, stuff like that. Do you know where we're going? <laughs> Say what? Do you know where we're going? No, he just said come out here, so I'm going to come out here. Okay. I'm just trying to get out. I need some love. Okay, guys. That was rough love. <laughs> we're trying to bring back the top five. Okay. <laughs> couple of quick trees we talked about right while we're here okay <laughs> sometimes biology can fool us for example you see these rounded ones up top there very tall those are called macadamias you probably know about macadamias right you eat their nuts maybe macadamia trees are not trees though they're actually vines so if you cut them down for example you don't see any tree rings therefore macadamias are actually vine nuts so if you have anybody allergic to tree nuts they usually can still eat macadamias another one that would fool us is this tree right here now I have some from SoCal, right, or California. So what do you guys think that tree looks like? It's like a palm tree. Anybody, palm tree. Anybody know the name of this one? Palm. Palm. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Royal Palm. Pretty easy on that one. And even though it's named Royal Palm and looks like a palm tree, it's actually not. It's a fern. This becomes really important because real palm trees are edible. For example, you heard of hearts of palm. This is any type of palm tree cut down, harvest the core, you get the heart of palm. So you can eat more than just the coconut itself. You can eat the coconut tree. But these, you cannot eat at all. So again, it just depends on what's what. Also, beautiful flowers called Holliconia. Um, this is the lobster claw variety, but it's, it's all related. Top. Bird of Paradise is another one. Oh. So, Bird of Paradise. Hey guys, Can I ask a question? Yes. Now, those have got rings. Do they, they, do they do the same thing like a regular palm tree where their, their fronds branch off? Because it looks like it's just got a really long, tight frond yeah. on it. So they grow based off the rings. So each one of the rings will keep moving the tree up and up and up. And okay, so it is just like the, the fronds of a regular. Yeah, they really are super close. Um, you see this in, you ever see those flat bladed, almost look like a fan? The prince, uh, the queen palm. Yes, okay, so there's two types of those. They're called traveler palms, which is the queen palm. Okay. And then there's the one called holiconia, where the leaves look like bananas, and they produce flowers similar to that. Okay. And they just look almost identical. Yeah. Now, what is this bush down here? Because we keep seeing these all over the island. and they just This look, one? Yeah. yeah. You know we'll come is? this way first. Just be careful on the surface here. We're just going to go right in here. Okay. Um, but that, I don't remember the name of that one. There's some history. You're talking about that colorful one between yeah. the two red flower ones? Yeah. Yes. The one that They're gorgeous. <laughs> careful. <laughs> I have a bad hip. That's so. okay. No problem. Get a stable <laughs> lose, spot first. I lose balance. 
That comes from India. I don't remember the name oh. of it, but I know that there's some history to it. You know, they look like spear tips. Yes. So the Indians have a story about all these different warriors that had different color spears. And that's why the flowers are all these different colors. It's beautiful. I, I don't know too much more about it, but uh, you know, I tried learning a little bit. It's beautiful. Okay, guys, welcome to the coffee trees. But I got one last cool plant to talk about, and that's this one. This is called aloe. Maybe you call it aloe. You're probably familiar with this plant. It's useful for all kinds of stuff like skincare. Yeah. However, you can ingest this. You can put it in your stomach, curing an ulcer. You can also use this to cure teeth. So if you were an old warrior, had to knock your tooth out, you put this in place. But there's a practical use for you guys. If you're taking any flowers home, maybe you're taking Hawaiian flowers with you, which you can do here. Pick some of this with you. It will not harm you. There's no spines. It's soft. Break a piece off, take the flowers, put it right inside. It's better than any type of flower food that you buy. This stuff will keep it nourished and hydrated for about three, four days. Wow. Fantastic. Now, is, this, is this a different variety being it's so much more narrow? It's a different variety. This is the original Hawaiian <laughs> strain. Um, I don't know where the word aloe or vera came from. I, I just know that. I, I have some at home and they're you know, much wider. They look more like yes. a cactus. Yeah, like a bigger succulent. Yeah, and these yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a more decorative looking. Yep. Okay, guys, right come here. on down to the coffee trees. Just be aware of that, please. Now, what you see here is one of 20,000 coffee trees on this farm here. Now, notice that there's multiple ripenesses on the same tree, beginning with the stump, the old part, and then we have the branches growing up producing fruit. Each one of these will be pruned off in different years. We don't want them too big and strong. See, for example, that one will probably leave us this year. As we pull them down, they could break. We don't want them to break, okay? That would damage the tree ultimately. What we're going to get is fruit off of them. We like to have maybe four producing fruit and then four growing up. So just a balance, okay? Off season, we'll cut them down. Then when we get fruit, we get it in rounds. So coffee is a jasmine tree. When it first starts raining, we get a bunch of tiny white flowers and it smells awesome out here like jasmine. But then the, the flowers turn into beans and therefore turn ripe. Then the next flowers will turn in each consecutive time. So we'll, uh, for example, we have a dark green. Those are the youngest. Then a yellowish color, that's the next one. Then a reddish color, that's where we get into the ripeness, which is maroon. So our full ripe bean is colored a lot like this one right here, okay? I'll pick one in just a second. Then we get into the raisins, the ones we missed, and they got too old on us. Uh, not so bad on this tree, but you see black beans here and there. Those are ones we missed. Ultimately, this is why coffee tastes so different around the world. If you're drinking somebody's coffee like, uh, you know, the famous ones, Maxwell uh, House or, or Folgers, for example, you're drinking trees that most likely came from India, the number one country producing coffee in the world, 18%. And these are flat rows with nets. And a machine shakes this coffee, and whatever falls into the net is what you're drinking. Every ripeness of the same time in the same cup of coffee. You know what that's like? That's like trying to make banana bread out of green bananas, yellow bananas, brown bananas, and rotten in the same batch. That's not going to taste good. You don't want that. Just like you pick out ripe fruit to eat. So for us, to start with ultimate quality begins by harvesting ripe fruit. It's as simple as that. Our pickers come in and hand pick all 20,000 coffee trees on this farm to ensure the best quality coffee. And how often do they rotate through to So they start harvest. at somewhere around July, late July to August, depending on the season, of course. And then lasts all the way through about Christmas, maybe even into January. So they're out picking every day, just a different they're, section of the farm? Yes, and so it depends on what part. So for example, the lower altitudes will ripen faster. So keep in mind, less, more sun down there, less rain ripens faster. And then it ends earlier. And then the higher altitude section is going to have a little more rain, less sunshine, takes a little longer. So it's just a rotation. An average of 10 rounds, but they could go up to 15 in, in some big years. Every picking coffee, meaning uh, come in here, pick what's ripe, move to the next tree. Come back, pick what's ripe, come back again, to, again and again to pick all the bright uh, fruit ripe as possible. And how many people are in that crew doing that all So time? our crew is about 20 to 30. Mm -hmm. Now they live right here in our site. Down below we have a big dorm house. This dorm house houses all 20 to 30 of our pickers, depending on how many at the time. You know, early season, maybe less. Uh, they do come from uh, mostly other countries, but this is an area where the exchange rate works really well for them. Uh, nowadays, we don't play around with American politics, so everybody's legal here. And when we have our workers, they pick, they get paid per pound, and in the off-season, they usually play around because they make a lot of money. Some of them work very, very hard here for us. Uh, in fact, they will pick coffee for 12 to 14 hours in hot sunshine and downpouring rain. One of our farm managers right here, Sersh. Now, 
also these pickers after a 12 to 14 hour picking day might then process coffee for another couple of hours so keep in mind very hard work but a lot like you hear about alaska salmon fishers for example work really hard play hard for the rest of the year kind of stuff you got money <laughs> some of the pickers i've heard make up to 400 a day so it can be a lot of money in that short time frame okay work hard though very hard work now the ultimate paid, i'm sorry go they ahead. get paid by pound by pound yes okay. uh now uh come about one more month and the, uh, most of this tree will be red and that's when they're like you know and they pick really hard and, and they the really good fast ones can make that kind of money I, myself, for example, the highest I've ever picked was about 130 in a day um, when I was younger, of course. Um, the highest I've heard of is 700 in a day, wow. <laughs> just to give you a comparison. Right? <laughs> so those that are really good at it can pick some amazing amounts of coffee. Um, now, we want to pick it ripe to get the best freshness, okay? Um, these um, pickers are not the only workers, though. We do have some other young ones, so maybe you met Ryan up there, for example. Ryan is one of our trade workers. He lives right here in our dorm house as well. We give them complete food access. That means whatever food we just stock the shelves, they got all the food they want and a place to stay. And in trade for that, we give them or they give us 28 hours of work trade. This could be in our field doing weed eating or something. Notice no roundup. So we try our hardest to be organic and weed eating is what it takes. Lawnmower, stuff like that. We also work in processing where they like learn warehouse style work we'll talk about or in our store where they learn business or sales or, or uh, tours. So they get a plethora of different work experience, and these are open to any youngsters. So if you know anybody who wants to hang out in Hawaii for three to four months or so, like a college-age kid, for example, stay here, live here, work hard, but play hard too. Because after work, we jump in the pool. <laughs> Tough life. Right? If they want to work harder than 28 hours, they get paid for that extra work. And we even do excursions. We'll take them to the beaches here. Sometimes we clean up all the plastic first, and then we bust out the grill. You know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. fun, fun beach day afterwards. <laughs> so we try to make this fun, but it's not just limited to youngsters. Anybody that has the time and wants to do this, we did have a retired couple, Bill and Brenda, that were getting away from their kids. So <laughs> <laughs> we were like, hey, if you can do the work, you can stay with our kids down in the dorm. But uh, keep in mind, it's a lot of fun, just hard work. Right? Now, one of the jobs that has to be done on these trees is to uh, spray for our beetle. We do have one main nemesis, but we're lucky in most ways. You see goats here, pigs here, turkeys, none of them bother us. And we don't even have a lot of bugs to worry about. But 10 years, ago, 10 years ago, we got our main nemesis called CBB, coffee borer beetle. A tiny beetle about the size of a flea, which burrows into the fruit and leaves a nest. And what we get back is damaged fruit, damaged product, damaged beans. So we have a problem because these things took over the world. Ten years ago, they were in two countries, isolated and quarantined in Indonesia area. Then somebody smuggled coffee here, and we got infected. From there, ten years later, it's in every single country that produces coffee, everywhere. But we're the only ones in the U.S. We're the only ones that didn't use chemical poisons to spray and kill this beetle. We were left without anything, and our first season afterwards dropped by about 80%. Yeah. These numbers were so devastating that Kona had to do something, and that's when the state got involved. They did two very important things. First, they created the state quality mandated level called 100% Kona, which we'll talk about down in processing. But they also got some ecologists and they said, find an enemy now, please. Eventually, they found right in our soil a native species of fungus. Today, this fungus is used as a spray to spray it on our trees. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, it's useful for so many good reasons. Check it out. First, it lives here. We don't have to import anything. And those of you know, we don't want to import all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Because we end up with worse sometimes. And then also, and not only that, but check it out, a fungus doesn't affect us as humans, right? We eat mushrooms and whatnot. But to the beetle, it's a natural enemy. It kills it on contact like an allergy, like an anaphylactic shock. Wow. That means we need no chemical, no poison, no pesticide, nothing. An organic kill. We add other organic things. We add garlic, which fertilizes right on the leaves, foliar feeding. We add chili peppers, which once sprayed on the trees, stops ants from wanting to crawl on them. We're no dummies, we're not gonna beat up ants. But we can stop them from wanting to be in our trees. Thankfully, last, this beetle spray is so useful because it doesn't harm bees. Very important that we tell you that the uh, Big Island of Hawaii has the healthiest bee population on the planet. 95% of queen bees purchased in the world come from one island right here. I watched a special one yep. time that said that if the bee population in the world disappears, that Hawaii will be the one to regenerate the sanctuary. them. We're already doing it. We're already doing it. So check it out. We're, we're really re replenishing the world's bees here. So I please support this industry. Check it out. We have our own 30 beehives on our farm. Please try our honey. 
try all the honeys you are on this uh, island just to just to get this thing going because it's a big big deal for the world you're right yeah all right so we're going to learn about all what this did to our industry down in processing because today we're down to about five percent field damage we're being pretty effective Ooh. but for example kara here she's one of our trade workers hello good morning what, one of those jobs she might be doing is spraying for the beetle and that way we, we uh, process or we get rid of this beetle as best we can now, have you guys shared that technology with the other coffee producers in the world to... Yes, but they don't really care because it's so expensive. To do the mold? Yes. For example, um, just this farm's 40 acres costs us about $180,000 a year. So, coat of prices are high. Uh, <laughs> it's just the way it goes. But that's how we get the best quality. Um, other countries just simply can't afford that. that well, and plus they're probably still using chemicals, so they don't care. <laughs> For example, let me give you one that we don't use on this farm. It is legal in the United States. I can't remember the name of it. It starts with a P. It's legal in the United States. We choose not to use it. Because we choose not to use it, we can sell our coffee to countries like Japan and Korea. These two countries test for this chemical. So it's not illegal to use this, but two humongous buyers are not going to buy your coffee if you have that in it. So that's, what, that's one we choose not to use is this chemical. So it's kind of cool that this farm tries hardest to be close to organic. Uh, we just can't afford the organic stamp. It's just way too much money and you don't get much money back. So yeah. But as far as being an organic stamped farm, it's it's quite expensive to go through that process. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, let's head down to our, our processing center. On the way down, you'll notice that we have an avocado tree here. This is called Charwell. Charwells have one of 66 varieties of avocados here. Now these ones are about half grown, so they're gonna get a lot bigger. Give me an extra hand, I can help. I, I just get unstable. No, yeah, I'm no okay. Worries. It's just get out of the way if and, I start rolling. And also, too, <laughs> I don't want to back, roll anybody down. On the way back up, we have a gator we can call, so no problem. Okay. okay. I just, I'm okay if I go slow and nobody yeah. gives me a bad time. <laughs> now, a quick note on avocados. We're going to change the world there, too. Two years ago, we produced the official Guinness World Record holding avocado, a six-pound variety called Linda. Oh no joke, Linda. it was this big. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, we have a lot of Californians today. You guys are going down. <laughs> <laughs> we also are producing bacon flavored avocados. Oh my God. They're a Hoss variety. We have no idea how nature does this yet, but if we can ever figure out how to do it again and again and again, bacon avocados will hit your market. Oh my God. <laughs> it does. Okay, again, be careful on the way down here. But these, so these look like they're edible already, but they're not. You try to ripen them, they're not going to taste it. Yeah, I noticed they're huge. Yeah. We've been yeah, seeing them and they're just the huge. These ones get about like that. Yeah, yeah we, we, we saw some at. coming up the road. I was like, holy cow. I you had, um, like, that's guacamole in the works there. My father has this old family recipe, a cone of coffee and avocado cream pie with a coconut macaron <laughs> crust. It's oh just my killer. God. <laughs> so in avocado season, I make it nonstop. <laughs> All right, we're well, just going to go explains, to where the shade is. So. That kind of explains the and avocado you can chair, candy, okay. too. I don't need to sit out. I just need no to problem. I just wanted to offer. Chippy. <laughs> now we have um, uh, some shade down here, so we'll just come around. Try to avoid the mud if you can, but you're welcome to get up on here for pictures, and we'll tell you what's going on now. So we'll get you up there for a second in a little bit, but we're going to start down here in the shade. <laughs> we have some bug spray if anybody forgot upstairs, but it shouldn't be too bad right now. Come here at three o'clock, man. <laughs> oh really? Hot and bugs, yeah. They eat you. They were biting me over there. Yeah, they stop after two years. <laughs> I swear, my dad is always a, everybody that comes here. He says that to him right away. He's like, "Don't worry, the mosquitoes get used to it after two years. They won't even bother you." And it's true. Every single person that's been here for two years, the mosquitoes don't even. They, they, it's like you don't even know they're there because they, they're not like other dry. places. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they, don't, they just don't like. It's like, ah, we got we got plenty of people coming here all the time. We don't you probably start. <laughs> you probably start eating enough of the natural stuff that they just. I eat. something about yeah, the taste because I've heard B12 too. If you're high in B12, they don't bite you. It's called Lihing Moi. Anybody tried mm -hmm. Lihing Moi, a local treat? Lihing. Seriously, you can get this stuff on little seed and candies in the store. You can get it on a margarita rim. You can get it on all kinds of stuff. Sweet and tart. Uh, it's red powder. That oh, so good. We grew up eating that kind of stuff. Okay, guys, welcome to the processing center. 
The building is originally called a hoshidana. This is part of that Japanese heritage. The roof had a sliding building or sliding roof. They would dry the coffee, slide the roof back over. Nowadays, though, we've expanded, and of course, clear plastic makes the roof easier. And they used to even live underneath, but of course, we try to preserve this tradition here. Still a barn, though. Now, the pickers will pick their fruit and drive right here to weigh their coffee. That's the first step. Pay them, right? We pay per pound. But a lot of people want to know how much of the fruit ends up as roasted product. So this part might surprise you. 100 pounds of fruit is only 12 pounds of roasted coffee, just 12%. Wow. So it's important to make use of everything that we can, all right? So what we're going to do first is we're going to drop it into this bin. And you can see one of those colorful geckos over there. These are coming from Madagascar. Um, there is a secret. You slide up to them and you whisper and you might get a discount on car insurance. <laughs> I can't help it, it's fun. <laughs> we drop it into the chute. This is a process called washed coffee, okay? Washed coffee means we're gonna wash everything off first. The first process of that is to float it in water and anything we don't want will float. Branches, leaves, any of the really bad beetle damaged beans or any of the old raisins should all float up so we can just get rid of it. The quality stuff sinks because it's heavy. The white tube transports it to the top bin. This is where we separate rocks and other heavy objects. Now, quick question. If we pick fruit off trees, why do we have to separate rocks? Because the bags are on the ground. The bags are on the ground, which means sometimes the hand pickers get paid per pound. We'll put rocks in the bags. So we have to make sure nobody's cheating us. But also, this could be totally uh, innocent. We found cell phones, wallet keys, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> on so we got to separate all that stuff out. Okay? Yeah, that would make very good coffee. <laughs> now, you see there's a cylindrical bin right there. That is called a, uh, a pulper machine. So what we do is we take the fruit right off the tree and we pulp it right away. We just don't like fermentation on our normal washed coffee. We don't like the flavor. We choose to pulp it immediately. And that's why these workers will pick 12 to 14 hours and then still pulp coffee afterwards. A long day. But this ultimately gives us the best flavor. Break the fruit off immediately and don't ferment at all. The fruit then goes down into a truck. We sell it off. The fruit husk is the only other part we can reuse because it has twice as much caffeine as the bean does and a ton of potassium. The fruit can be dried into a, a fruit that you can add to a natural energy bar. It can be dried into a coffee cherry caffeinated tea called cascara. You can make liquor from it. You can extract caffeine powder and potassium. Both can be sold just over the hill. The owner of Monster Energy lives a mile away. So <laughs> lots of caffeine sold there, right? Now this, co this coffee will then go through the rest of the processing coming out where the black tube is and that is where we scrub off that sweet layer. You remember that sticky sweet? Oh no, I didn't get to that one. Not yet. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you guys a ripe fruit. I'm sorry, I missed that part. But I'm going to get you guys a ripe fruit off the tree and show you what it looks like by hand. Okay. Now the sweet <laughs> layer is called uh, mucilage and it will be scrubbed off in that part where the black tube comes out. And then finally we get to this stage and this is called parchment. This is where we dry it. We have to dry this coffee for about a week under high heat conditions. So the reason I start you here is because it's very hot in there. I'm going to get you in here for a second. Okay, we're going to rake some coffee and have some fun for a second. But it's really hot, so if you need to, come back out under the shade. Or just we're going to just do this quick and then we'll all be back under the shade. Okay? To rake this coffee, because it's very important. If you don't touch this coffee, the bottom gets mildewy and the top gets crispy. So you have to constantly rotate it. We rate coffee once every single hour from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. <laughs> to ensure that it dries properly, all right, for about a week time. Is that, okay, why, you do, is that why you do your uh, tours in a rotation of an hour so we do the raking? <laughs> 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 Good. <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to go rake some coffee real quick. Um, you're welcome to if I can get a volunteer to rake coffee just to check it out. Um, but I want you to know how important this is because just that middle pile that we're going to be on, about $10,000 worth of coffee, okay? So come on out here. You guys will gather right in here somewhere. We're going to grab this Volunteer that wants to try raising 
first step is to always push. Don't ever pull back from that. Okay? And when you push, you don't have to climb. You want to hold it low. Okay? And now keep pushing. You can do any pattern you want. Criss, cross, or spiral. And you don't miss the most important part. Walk right out. Try to walk out. Yeah, she definitely me out. Any pattern, okay? There's a reason we can walk on this, all right? Because there's still two very protective layers that we have to remove, and it goes through a 500 degree roasting process. You're not ever gonna have any contamination or anything like that. But yes, this is why we have hourly tours of free labor. <laughs> now, is this a day's worth of, or a week's worth of picking, or how much is, how many? This file is one day. This is one day. So you said they're under here for a week. Yes. So you guys, every day will make a new okay. pile? Well, it's <laughs> it's, each one pile will be raised until it's dry. And then from here it goes under the building. Anybody else? I want to try it. Okay. I want to try this. <laughs> kind of like playing shuffleboard, you know? I want to do like a spiral okay. or sideways or whatever. Right. But uh, very important to push, not pull backwards. Okay. Yeah. So pulling backwards, it will act like a break. We don't want to break things up, we just want to push it around. Okay? It's kind of like one of those huge little fan sculptures. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is hard. Notice it looks like a Japanese Zen garden. So That's comes, what I was talking about. It comes straight from the old tradition, too. <laughs> now, I do have an example, so we will be getting through these layers in just a second, but we're just doing the raking right here, okay, because I know it's hot. Our intended temperature in the middle of the day is somewhere around 110 degrees, so and we want it to be hot, but uh, it's not exactly fun for humans on vacation. <laughs> all day on a normal, typical work shift. Not only are they gonna test it every hour, rake it every hour, but sometimes the batches mid-hour have to be pulled. You know, for example, when the moisture meter hits 10 to 11%, we're gonna pull this batch. But if it's 12%, it's close, and in that hour, it's gonna be ready. So we have to monitor it in the middle of the hour to pull it at the optimum time. The coffee contest have ultimately taught us that drying coffee is a very, very important step. And using the sun produces the best quality of The problem is, okay, let's head back to the shade. We'll finish up the tour there. <laughs> it's a good talk. Good talk. Yeah, first push was like, oh my god. Okay, now I remember what it's like to be young. That's all good. But it's fun. Now, what's the, what's the purpose of these smaller ones? So if we ever have any type of separation, we want to make sure it keeps separate and labeled. Doesn't matter what we're doing, we're going to keep it separated and labeled. These two piles right here, remember I told you that some stuff floats? So we want to see if any of that's usable. I'm about to show you what's going to break, but if anything is usable, we're going to use it, right? Anything not goes back in the lab. This copy right here can be filtered in our machine. Now, one thing I'm going to talk about in just a second is that we have a very, very nice machine these days that helps us. So let's get to that part. Uh, but I want to show you what this is here. So just get back into the shade, please. That is called a navel orange. So if you find any of those oranges that are orangey colored, they don't have to be all orange, even sometimes green is still ripe here. Uh, you can wash it off with the water hose there, and you can take one as long as it's not damaged, I mean, whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> Does anybody know why they're called navel oranges? Because of the way the little belly the little button looks navel. on the yes. bottom, not on the top. So check this oh, out. I, I just learned yeah. something myself. Now, I've always known that because they have a belly button, mm -hmm. oh. they're called a navel orange, belly button, right? Oh. Navel. Okay. But something I just learned about biology a month ago. You ever open one of these oranges? You cut them like a sun-kissed orange. And you cut them in half, and there's a little baby orange on the other it's side. It's on the bottom. Navel oranges are conjoined twins. Mm -hmm. It also, has it also has something to do with the way the flower develops, that it develops inside and then out. Inter internally and then yeah. out. Yeah. It's amazing yeah. how biology too. Yep. All these oranges really are different. <laughs> okay, guys, so please, uh, uh, if you want to see this one, come on a little closer. This is called our peanuts, right? But this is the parchment layer right out there. Now, two more layers to go, okay? This one here is a shell, almost like an M&M &M layer, like an M&M &M shell, okay? So again, a machine will do this, but I'm going to do this by hand here. Crunch one like that. Okay. okay. Now, is that a byproduct you guys can sell? Right into the land. We can sell it to the land as fertilizer. 
Okay. <laughs> Everything's a byproduct. No, it's true. <laughs> uh, but on our farm, we don't sell it. We just give it back. To okay. Yeah. That makes no. You use it. But yeah, we use yeah. as much as we can here. So crispy shell. This is the aging layer. Now check it out. When you age it in this coffee, we do it for three months in our vault here at first. Some people do it six months. Me and my father do. Some people do it much longer. I did a two-year-old aged batch recently. Possibly we're starting into vintage coffee these days. We're just learning about this. In fact, one guy is seeing if you can do 20 years. He's 12 years in. So in eight more years, look to see. We might have our world's first 20-year vintage coffee. Set. So it's going to be sold like wine. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> we're from Lodi, so. Oh, yeah, Lodi. Well, I'm from yeah, Lodi. <laughs> Good Zinfandels. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, so mm -hmm. then we get one more layer. Notice it's hazy colored, right? Mm -hmm. Now, again, a machine does this, but I'm going to glue it with the fingernail, so I'm just going to do it a little bit to scrape this layer off. You notice that it's kind of a flake? Mm -hmm. Almost like dander. Almost like scales, yeah, like dander, mm -hmm. you know? Like from your head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to do the whole beans, but you see it how it's gray. all starting to fall off, right? Yep. This is called silver skin. Roasters will call this chaff. It's the stuff that floats up as ashes when you pull a roast out. So, so you see the green bean, right? Mm -hmm. Notice half shaped. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is a typical coffee bean. Mm -hmm. This one is a nice size one. I don't see any beetle holes or damage. So this is a pretty healthy looking bean right there. Well, it was. But <laughs> I want to show you what is and what's not actually good coffee. Okay. So, there is a state law here called 100% Kona coffee. As we drop our coffee off to the mill, they're gonna process out the actual green beans, just like we did by hand, okay? Then they're gonna return it to us, but they're gonna drop it into different size categories. But we have to get the defects out. That's extremely important. It doesn't really matter the size of the bean as it is the defects. We put it through a satake, a machine that is so advanced, a laser spins around, finds holes in the beans, defective colors, or any other defects and kicks them out. Yeah, so if you had a huge green bean, but then it had 10 holes in it, it would be kicked all the way down the layers and in fact out of what is called 100% Kona coffee. This is a state certification law that says the word 100% and the word Kona must appear together always. 100% can be word or numbers, but that's the only difference here. Otherwise, if you alter that in any way, they're getting around the state law. They don't have to follow the state law. It's a protected phrase, you see. So be careful yourselves. Any of us that go through this much work to get good coffee, we want to make sure you know it. And you will see 100% Kona right on our labels. But down in town, you might see 10% Kona blends. Well, the 10% Kona is not 100%. That means even the Kona in it is not very good. I'm going to show you what this is in a second. But the really tricky ones are 100% pure Kona. You see, by separating the words and adding pure in the middle, you guys think it's good coffee. It sounds like it. Mm -hmm. But they're actually just cheap coffee because they're just getting around the state law. So just be aware of that because you know what you're buying, right? And what you're actually buying is this stuff. And I'm going to pass this around starting here. Notice how beetle damaged it is. Notice how bad colors it is. Just nasty stuff. This is not good coffee. It's called off grain. okay? So they have to be mixed with the 100%. Yes, 100% cone. In fact, the word coffee does not actually have to be on there by law. 100% Kona are the two words you have to see. So, kind of yeah. like they do with orange juice. 100% vitamin C. There's no, not even any juice in it. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what is this? It's how these words are labeled. It's how they're presented to you that gets around it. Pure or the blends are popular. What if it's like 100% of Kona? Nope, like of the separate. Yeah. Another one to watch out for if they use one zero zero and then the word percent. Oh, that's a wow. tricky one, but that removes the state law. It's a word and a number together. You have to use either the number with Kona or the word with Kona. <laughs> so so one hundred and the percent sign works and one hundred percent in words works, but nothing if else. If it's labeled one hundred percent in words, it will say one, the word one, uh -huh. the word one hundred, the word percent. And then Kona. They can word it that way by law, but okay. nobody uses that. Everybody uses the number with the percent sign. Okay, that's what I And saying. then Kona. Okay. So that's how most people are going to write it. Hey, this is ugly. But I just <laughs> want you, if you see, there's one company that's old fashioned that does words 100% Kona, and that is allowed by the law. It's ugly coffee. Very ugly. Coffee. <laughs> you don't want to buy me any of that, honey. I would be ugly after that. <laughs> That is ultimately bad usually. <laughs> this, is, this is probably church coffee. 
<laughs> Randy makes the coffee. So now, here's a good question. I jumped ahead of the audience again. Yeah. So, what we're going to call this coffee? Well, we can't call it 100% Kona, but it's still usable. You just don't want to drink it. And believe me, I'm not going over the food stuff today because we're not a food place. But food grade has its own grade, so just keep that in mind. Food, they have to follow requirements too. Up in our store, you see Kona coffee candles, right? You see Kona coffee soap. That's Definitely the kind of stuff yes. we're going to use that coffee for. So for the, still the stuff that they use to scrub in yes, and that kind of stuff. Yes, because it doesn't matter on the body, but it does matter in taste. That's the ultimate. Now, we have four layers of Hawaiian 100% Kona tiered coffee. These are the certification levels, but this part gets really confusing. So I'm going to make it simple by using numbers. We know numbers. Words are hard because they change things on us. 16, 19 here, 16, of course, 17, 18 are in the middle, right? These are the four tiers of 100% Kona. 16 is the lowest based on the size millimeter. You know, it's just a smaller bean. 19 is the larger bean, but remember, the defects are ultimately what matter. So 16, a by state law still allows 20% defects. That's 20 beans out of 100. The 19 is called extra fancy. That's right, it is the top dog. This stuff only allows 0.8% defects. That is eight beans out of a thousand. That's how strict it is. And that's why there's four tiers. Because remember, four tiers, you break this up while you're buying it for friends, then family, and then yourself. <laughs> and then your boss when you need a promotion. Right? <laughs> now the four tiers we make fun of, but they're confusing by the state law. If it's not labeled, if it says 100% Kona but not labeled a tier, it is automatically this one called 16, also known as Prime. But it's still good quality, 100% Kona. Now here at this farm, we take our 16 quality and we sell it to people like Costco. And that's how Costco will end up with 100% Kona, but it's the lower tier. We want the better ones. So we take the two middle ones, we merge them into what we call a state. So when you're upstairs in our store, our lowest tier appears as a state. And that way, our best stuff, extra fancy, appears as the top tier. So that's how you see it, okay? State and extra fancy, okay? So go ahead and look at these two. Again, you notice the bean size difference, but it's the defects that ultimately matter more. Also, this mutation is rare. 
Um, uh, nature only provides us 3 to 7% of pea berry. That's it. We do not know what it looks like on a tree. You can't purposely pick it, for example. Also, labs have tried to recreate it, like UH Hilo, and have not been successful. Therefore, we still only get what nature gives us, 3 to 7%. So how does the tree propagate? It, we have no clue. It's a mutation. No, no, no. How does it propagate? How does the tree start its life? I mean, I know you guys graft on, but does it start from a bean? Normally in nature, it would start from a bean and the bean grows out. So, but they've tried to grow these from a bean and it doesn't generate yes. a tree that creates those. Yes. So, for example, uh, a, a lab technician came out. He was allowed to pick an entire row and document everything. We gave up the entire row. Okay. What happened was that he was able to find it as no pattern whatsoever to where it grows on the tree or why it grows on the tree. But he did find out that some of them were pea berry and because he documented it, he found them. Then he tried to grow straight from the pea berries and he did not get pea berry. So we just have no clue why it happens. But because it's the best tasting and the most rare, pea berry is like the creme de la creme that sits on top. It also follows the 100% Kona guidelines. So if you want to make sure it's good pea berry, Look for 100% Kona pea berry. So once again, it's the 100% Kona that is attached to any of these tiers. Can I ask one more question? One more. Now, does this have any uh, better property of being um, not being hit by the beetle? Does it? No. no? Just as a, just so as I'm, I'm not seeing as many. Well, there are a few. There's some. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I was just curious. Oh, sorry. No. Pea berry would be like saying 20 on that scale. It looks like barley. Yeah. Like a big healthy good, barley. Yeah, it's a good stuff. Is that just what it's called? Like it's prime number one fancy extra fancy. Pea berry. Yeah, but pea berry is the only one that. Pea berry is a little bit different in the way that it will grow on any tree in the world. So the 100% the, the, the Kona part I gave you is a state certification. They, they literally have a whole chart that says this and this and this and this and this. Um, but pea berry, you could be in Colombia and you could buy pea berry. Just yeah. Okay guys, I just want to touch on roasting really quick. So if you have other roasting questions, just ask after this, okay? Most of our roasts come from big batch roasters. Give it a thousand pounds at a time, roast it all the same way, make sure it's globally consistent. And it's a lot like a microwave push the popcorn in, right? And the machine does it, that's just the way it works. But at Heavenly One, we have an antique way of roasting coffee. So if you see the label called Fire Roast up top, that is done on a night. 47 antique coffee roaster. Uh, it's actually my father's. It was passed down to me over the years. I've been learning how to use it for about 15 years now in that old way. No gadgets whatsoever. If you happen to be here on Friday, we do it right here every Friday, fire roasting Fridays. Uh, and we do it the old way. It's fun because there's no gadgets on this machine, just me doing it. I even hit the drum with my hand for temperature. That's the only way I know how hot it is. Uh, but it allows fire in the drum, therefore you get fire roasted coffee. And the taste is almost like a campfire, smoky, or almost like something that got grilled. You know what I'm talking about? So, propane or wood? It's propane. Wood doesn't have even consistent heat. It's really hard. Some people do. Yeah. Um, okay, so guys, I just want you to kind of keep the coffee fresh, and then we'll get you back on top. Okay? To keep coffee fresh, ultimately, it's about the oil. Now you know oil goes rancid. You ever get that fancy oil like olive oil? Eat it up or drink it up because this oil is going to go bad on you. Coffee is no different. When you get our, st our stuff off our store, it's roasted less than a week old. That means it's fresh. That means you want to consume it quickly. Now, if you live in a really dry humidity, like California, you're blessed with dry humidity, you've got about six weeks. Otherwise, you have about a month for ultimate freshness. That's because the oil starts to degrade. Coffee doesn't go bad, it degrades. Coffee in the store can be two years old, but it doesn't taste good. So to preserve the oil, put it in the freezer after that time frame. One month or six weeks in a dry, dry climate, okay? After that, put it in the freezer as whole bean. It is healthier for the oil to stay as whole bean. But guess what? The beans don't freeze. So there's a trick to the freezer, and that is never let your container defrost. If you let it defrost, you get moisture on the inside, and that's why you get freezer burn. Leave it in the freezer, whole bean right into your grinder, and this is ultimately the most fresh way to preserve coffee. But the best way to enjoy it is to just drink it fresh. <laughs> and then let us replenish it for you. We have a fantastic coffee club. I'll close with this. Our coffee club is pretty simple. No sign-up fees, no fees to change or cancel or anything like that. Uh, I think everybody is U.S. shipping today. Free shipping in the U.S. Also, no taxes. If you took
took our best coffee and broke it down per cup. Keyberry was only $1.50 a cup. Two cups of some of the best coffee in the world is the same price as McDonald's. Four cups is the same price as Star Pews. <laughs> right. Gotta make fun of Starbucks, right? <laughs> but yes, just keep that in mind. Fresh coffee, roasted less than a week old, delivered to your door. Much cheaper than you may think. And if you choose to sign up today, we sweeten your deal. We give you a free bag of that candy. And I know you guys, most of you had all that candy already. So be careful. There, some of them are highly caffeinated. You may have heard me say that earlier. So watch out for the tweets. Um, <laughs> but this time our tour is over. So if you guys have any questions, please ask. And again, I'm born and raised on this island. If you want to know about anything to do here, whether it's snorkeling or lava stuff or, or you know, beach or restaurants, just ask. Okay. Thank you. All right. Questions. Are you guys starting little trees in here? Is that what that's This for? is our nursery. Okay. Uh, I don't know which one, but one side has a tree called Liberica, which is a tree type that does not taste good whatsoever. It actually tastes like dirt. The other side is Arabica. That's the best known one. It tastes better than any other. There's Robusta, but we don't have that here. Uh, we graft the two together. Liberica, which is this tree, is the most strongest, yeah. right? It's it's just, the, the roots right. are the strongest. It's just an amazing, amazing uh, tree, but it doesn't taste good. So we graft the Arabica on top, and then basically we end up with the best of both worlds. Yeah, that's what they do with the grapevines in Lola and Lola. I have a friend down south who's got an old citrus tree. He cut it down and has a big stump, right? And he grafted carefully five other citrus. So you walk around one tree, you get lemons, limes, grapes, oranges, and tangerines. Mm -hmm. I mean, not grapes, but um, grapefruit. And yeah. you're like, what the, how did, yeah. how did you know? And each one of them is ripe at a different time, so you always have fruit. Yep, it's they have, really they really have cool. the same thing over in California <laughs> called fruit salad trees. Yeah. They have five different fruits on one yeah, awesome. on one I, stump. It's um, odd. Avocados is what we're doing. So I'm my dad has two trees. They're the ones that taste like bacon. Mm -hmm. But they only, <laughs> no joke, they really do. But they only come like every two to three years. Uh, we can't figure out why. <laughs> what I'm trying to do is test soils on different years. Um, you have to document all the weather. Document everything. So we have that. We have all the weather. I have weather documented back, back to 71 when my dad purchased. So I have that. Um, but it's weird. It's like... Why does nature give us this wonderful avocado? Does it give it and a strong it smoked flavor? Is it's that a smoky it's pork. Smoky yeah, it's pork. a smoky pork flavor. It's it's. So I gave about a hundred to different friends, uh -huh. and I said, "Hey, try this avocado. I just Tell want to see what you think. think." Yeah, I didn't even mention it, right? And about seventy percent was smoky pork, and about thirty percent was bacon. So bacon sounds better, but it, yeah. it really is more like smoky, well, smoky people pork. know bacon. Yes. Yeah, you say bacon avocado together. It's like California needs to run it high. <laughs> We, we put bacon on our on our avocado sandwich. Well, that's the whole point. <laughs> do this with just the avocado. Oh, don't don't give up the bacon. Yeah, no, no, don't no, don't. I know. <laughs> Some Randy's a bacon aficionado, right? All right. Anybody else? Any questions? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, the rest of us, we're gonna start walking up. Uh, whenever you guys are ready, no problem. Uh, what I'm gonna do first, though, is head right to the tree. I'm gonna pick a right one. I forgot one step. I apologize. But I want to show you what it looks like from the tree. Okay. talked about this stuff so I'm kind of just going to go over it quickly. You can only do this when you hand pick ripe because if it's green or any other color this is too hard to do. It's like stuck on but once it's ripe the sugars release and it gets soft. Then by hand we can squish the fruit from fruit to bean. Now we learned about the three layers. First was to scrub off this layer so you're welcome to touch this if you want. It's sticky and slimy you can taste it. It'll taste kind of like honey. All of this is edible, but green beans will break teeth, so do not try and crunch them ever. Okay. Yeah, right. But they taste good. Taste good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's so cool. 
Said, you see how much goes in, involved just to get from the fruit, right? Mm -hmm. So now your your system automatically does that rub process to yes. puff them out. It's scrub, yeah, yeah. It basically breaks this fruit off. You guys want to taste the actual bean with that sticky layer? Just oh, don't try and bite it. Just, just don't bite it. Just touch it. Yeah, it can. I, I know it breaks teeth. Trust me. <laughs> you want to try and taste? No. Okay. Just go ahead and put it back and then lick your finger. Yeah. Oh. You can taste the whole bean. You just put it back. You're down. the last one. Last just don't one. bite it. But yeah, just don't bite it. Because yeah. it'll break, break your teeth. Your tooth. <laughs> it's very compact. They're very hard. It would be like crunching on a rock, really. Very little give. Now, here's the fruit part. We talked about what we can use it for. Only when you pick it right like this is it going to taste somewhat like a cranberry. So, I can pick another one, no problem. Uh, anybody have nails that can help me out? Yeah, I can try and or break you can it. try and rip that in two. Can you guys do that? Rip that in two. Do that two here. Here, I've got four. And take a piece. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else want to try it? Oh, we got a little piece. Yeah, I got more fruit. Can just eat the whole thing? Yeah. Um, anybody else? Uh, yeah. Yeah. This one would be like really sweet if nobody wants to try this one. So, again, you see how the fruit's useful. Um, I have a friend of mine that's developing a new fruit bar for sports athletes. Uh, we know that they have bananas on the sidelines like football games, right? Mm -hmm. So we're trying what's called a potassium bomb. It's fruit, this, with tons of potassium and natural caffeine. Uh, uh, apple bananas, if you, if you leave Hawaii without trying apple bananas, you're oh, doing a disservice to yourself. They're so they're good. They're amazing bananas. Sweet potatoes and avocado all have really high potassium. So we're squishing them into a fruit bar, basically, in like a square that an athlete can consume right there in the sideline and just get one big natural burst. This would actually actual be good with uh, um, oatmeal too. Mm. Interesting. Okay, yeah. Or I'm like a rolled that. rice, the whole rolled kernel rice, because yeah. it's got a little bit of a. It's not even so much a cranberry taste, but it's got an unusual taste yeah. to it. It's pretty good though, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, guys, we're gonna start uh, walking back up. So uh, take your time. You're welcome to take any pictures. No problem. Uh, but let's slowly start working our way back up. Any of those candies that you did not try earlier, please make sure you grab some. If you have any further questions, if you're going to Black Sand Beach, don't miss the abandoned resort. Just saying. The abandoned resort. We were wondering what beach is a good swimming beach. We know a lot of them are rocky around here. Yeah, uh, swimming beach. Okay. All depends on waves. Please keep in mind if you see waves, determine on your own if it's safe for your own condition. That's all I can say because it can change. Right now, they're small on this side. So about eight miles or so that way is called Magic Sands, or White Sands Beach. Um, as long as there's sand there, it's a beautiful beach. When is low tide? Low tide is usually morning and then um, later in the evening. Okay. You got here last night. Like, there's no beach anywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, in the Magic Sands, the beach comes up high, or the water does. But it also, you know, we just don't have that many. Yeah. A fantastic beach is called Coloco. It's um. It's in the Costco area by the marina. It's the marina by the airport. Go into the marina, take the right turn, go around to the back where they park boats and they have like coat washing and stuff. There's a huge parking lot. In one corner is the best on the wall seafood place called Keone's Point of View, by the way. And on the opposite side of the parking lot is a gate. There's a sign that says Shoreline Access. And this is the public entrance to this beach. So you just park in that parking lot, Walk right through the gate where the path is, and you'll see you get all the way to the beach. That is an awesome beach. It doesn't really have waves, but it has a beautiful ocean. It has sandy beach that you can just walk on forever. Best spot for sunset this time of year, so if you're thinking about that. There's a flying temple there. There's a boat the cleanest bathrooms of most beaches. I mean, <laughs> it's a good beach. Turtles, I'm always turtle there. So if you want to turtle that, or Punalu, the one down south, and you have turtles too. That one has an abandoned resort. You can actually walk all the way through a whole resort. Yep. Yeah. All right, guys, head on up. Bye, thank you. Yeah, if you're headed down south of Punalu, the Black Sand Beach, there's a pond on the other side of the ocean. 
All you do is literally walk around the back side of the pond, and there's an entire resort with a whole bunch of buildings literally destroyed in 1975 by a tsunami. And now you can walk all the way through it, and it, you can actually see where they like check guests in, and you can see their kitchen. I mean, it's if humans walked away and nature took over, you can see trees literally grow right through the roof. And nobody went back. And it's and all tried. free, and it's completely free. Nobody went through and tried to reclaim that. Oh, wow. Some people have vandalized, but nobody reclaimed it. There was a lot of controversy with it, and they just dropped it. They're like, oh, what's it called? Uh, I don't even know what it's called, oh. but it's, it's Punalu is the black sand beach down all the way south. It's real popular. The turtles are usually there by the very south tip point. Um, so check that out. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. It's yeah. Sounds interesting. Okay, so you have guavas. <laughs> Although some of them are getting kind of old. Yeah. <laughs> uh, papaya. Mm -hmm. Red papaya. Apple bananas, so you can try those. Oh, okay, yeah. Grapefruits, coconut, of course. And these are called jackfruit. Yes, I've seen that. They are technically the largest fruit in the world. Someone said they tasted like smells. They taste like juice. Really? It's kind of like crossing mango. Asking questions you want. Grab up some of those candies you had earlier. This is the view from the coffee bar. The brittle's really good with our coffee, so grab up a pairing if you like. So that was the end of our tour. So we're back up here and we've got four different kinds of coffee to try. Silk medium roast, fire roast medium, medium, bold medium roast, silk dark roast. And they did make us a special coffee today that they used the whole bean on without peeling it off. And it was a very different, distinct taste. Yes, I called it fermented taste, but it's not really fermented like you would alcohol. But it's got a fruit flavor to it, too, because the fruit was left on.